generations to come. And good afternoon. It's another edition of the Thoroughbred Daily News Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Finley. I'm Randy Moss with NBC Sports. Zoe Cabin here with First Racing and XBTV. And Doodle right here giving Lucy a run for her money today. Lucy better watch out. She's she's <laughs> She doesn't have all four legs in the air oh. yet, but we're waiting for that. Lucy is unconcerned. <laughs> yes, and uh, I'll see if I can find Penny somewhere and we can put on the uh, trio of our uh, three mascots. Well, welcome to the show. We want to remind you that this week it is brought to you and each and every week by our good friends at Keeneland. Right now they're in the middle of the January sale by all reports going very, very well down there. Okay, gang, the big story on the racetrack last weekend. Have you ever heard this before? Trust me, maybe you haven't. I don't know, if it's a blockbuster, just hold on, everybody. There was a three-year-old race and... Bob Baffert dominated it? We've seen that before now, haven't we? But uh, again, I'm being uh, facetious, so tongue-in-cheek a little bit. But they ran the sham stakes uh, at Santa Anita on Saturday. And this is how good and how deep his barn is. He didn't run his first string. He didn't run his second string. I think he ran his third string in this race. And he finishes one, two, three. He entered four horses, but Speedboat Beach was scratched. Finishes first with reincarnate, second with Newgate, and third with National Treasure. And, you know, we're used to Baffert at this point in time having a lot of good three-year-olds. I'm not sure from a quantity standpoint, quality will will hold off. We'll just see because it's a little bit early to tell. But from a quantity standpoint, I don't know if we've ever seen him have anything like this. For instance, here's a couple of numbers for you. Uh, On the winter book at Caesars, eight of the top 20 horses in the odds for the Kentucky Derby right now are trained by Baffert. In T.D. Thornton's top uh, 13 that he does already out for the Thoroughbred Daily News, Three of the top seven, all trained by Baffert, and none of those three horses ran in the sham stakes. Getting back to my point that it was not even his first string. But Randy Moss, we've seen it before, but, you know, Bob Baffert, and we'll have to get into at some point in time what's going to happen. Are these horses going to wind up in the Tim Yak teen barn because of the ban Churchill Downs has against Baffert that extends through this year's Kentucky Derby? But I got to tell you, Randy, right now, I mean, Bob Baffert seems to be holding all the cards, at least in the West Coast. Oh, yeah. I mean, back in the barn uh, watching all this were Cave Rock, who, of course, was the beaten favorite in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, finishing a good second to Forte. A couple of horses that just broke their maidens very impressively. Arabian Night back on the uh, Breeders' Cup Day undercard at Keeneland. Extremely impressive. Faustin, a son of uh, of Curlin, broke his maiden in late December at Santa Anita. He's got having a meltdown. We don't know about the distance capabilities there. Who knows what else he's got in his barn? And look, National Treasure is a really nice three-year-old who was a solid third in the sham, ran well. Uh, All three horses ran exceptionally well. Buyer speed figure, 95. And what struck me about the way they did it, guys, is that it was a very contentious pace, right? And Reincarnate and National Treasure were right up there. Newgate came from a little off the pace. But anytime you see a three-year-old, especially a young three-year-old in January, run that kind of a buyer speed figure off of a pace where they went three quarters of a mile in 109.55, uh, that's a sign that there's some uh, there's some real quality there. Yeah, it really was a terrific race. And, you know, the longest shot wins the race 16 to 1 on reincarnate for, for Bob Baffert there, the son of good magic. He's a little larger than your regular son of good magic. Watching him walk around the paddock, he is an absolute beast. In fact, to to say that one of Bob Baffert's looked fat in the paddock, he did. He was an absolute monster. Bob's saying afterwards that they've been saying all along that this is his Belmont horse. Well, they might need to reconsider that right now. But he was gritty. He was gutsy. He got a good trip. Uh, National Tre- Treasure maybe didn't get the best of trips, but none of them disgraced themselves. And they they ran hard. They ran hard into a very, very fast pace. A couple of other notes about Baffert's dominance, first of all, in this race. The fourth time in a row he's won the Sham, seven out of the last 10 years, nine in all. Last year, 2022, he was 1-2. In 2021, he finished 1-2. In 2020, he finished 1-2. Also, there was a horse in this race, Spun Intended who pulled up at the top of the stretch. I texted with trainer Mark Glatt this morning. A uh, spun intended underwent surgery Monday morning for a condylar fracture. Glatt said via text, the surgery went well, and we are optimistic that he will be okay. Yeah, I well, actually ran into Mark this morning, and he said he's resting comfortably at the barn. So thumbs up. I said, is that career 
uh, career ending. And he said, well, we don't know yet because a lot of times horses with condylar fractures do come back and run again. So certainly good news regarding spun intended. So guys, what are we going to do with the elephant in the room here? And, you know, we talk about Bob Baffert having this tremendous arsenal of talent, but right now as things stand, Bob Baffert will not be able to train them in the Kentucky Derby. He's still fighting this in the courts um, to me. And I think to most people who look at it kind of practically conventional wisdom is that he's not going to win, which would likely mean that perhaps he'll do exactly what he did last year, which would be to put all the horses in their, what would be their final prep for the Kentucky Derby in the name of someone else. Why not Tim Yakteen? That's what he did last year. And then Bob Baffert would not be able to train them in the Kentucky Derby. Whatever points they got in the last round of preps, the Arkansas Derby, the Santa Anita Derby, et cetera, would then presumably get them into the Kentucky Derby. If they, they ran fifth or sixth in the Santa Anita Derby, they're probably not good enough. Anyways, um, you know, it's a controversial subject. I'm glad it's almost over. After this Kentucky Derby, at least so far as bans and suspensions of Baffert, we won't have to talk about it again. It's all over. This is the last thing facing him. Um, it is what it is, I guess. I don't think that Baffert is really going to be able to do anything about it. He's going to have to swallow hard, it looks like, and miss another Kentucky Derby where, you know, he did all the heavy lifting on these horses and someone else presumably could be in the winner's circle holding that trophy. I'm sure that's not fun for Bob to have to deal with that. Um, some people think it's very fair. Some people think it's an abomination. He's a polarizing figure. We get it. But uh, I would say it is what it is. And uh, the only thing I'll, re uh, I'll reiterate, I'll be so glad when this is over. Yeah, the one, two, three finishers in the sham were owned, all owned by that group that are sort of colloquially known as the Avengers, uh, who showed last year that, it, you know, they were willing to change trainers to get their horses in the Kentucky Derby. One of the interesting things to follow is that Arabian Knight, who in many circles right now is one of the leading early contenders for the Derby, even though he's only run one time, is owned by Amr Zidane who owned Medina Spirit and who bankrolled a lot of the Bob Baffert legal challenges against Churchill Downs. No love loss there between Zidane and Churchill Downs. So it'll be interesting to see what Zidane chooses to do if Arabian Knight continues down the Derby Trail and is a legitimate contender. And I think the thing we'll see as well is sooner rather than later, if Bob hasn't figured this thing out. Well, I've got a lot going on back here. Apparently the grass grew overnight and everybody's mowing the lawns and the dog is barking. But We'll have to wait and see if uh, Bob manages to figure this out. Doodle has woke up. Doodle. Yeah, we can always count on Lucy to not move a muscle. Uh, <laughs> no, so, she's, you know. she's, she's out. She's dreaming about that. Doodle right now. Got, got to love that dog. Uh, okay, so that is the situation with Bob Baffert dominating several more preps to go. We also have to wonder, is, are, there, are there three more at the barn? Back at the barn, we haven't even seen Ron yet. That's always a possibility with him. I mean, this is about this time. In 2018, nobody knew who Justify was. He goes on to win the Triple Crown. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Keeneland. As you know, we're into the third day of the Keeneland January sale as we record this week's podcast, and the auction is off to a terrific start. Through the first two sessions, Keeneland sold 475 horses for an average of a little over 75,000, which is a 5.47 increase from last year. The current sales topper is a three-year-old warfront filly named Ancient Peace, who incidentally broke her maiden right here at Santa Anita by four and a quarter lengths in December. She was purchased for 650,000 by Board Short Stables. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. If this place could talk, it would roar. It would say, this is a racing. This beating heart in the heart of horse country. Steady and strong beneath the roar. Reminding us why. For the love of the horse. For generations to come. Spites Town. Bunning. Echo Town. It's Echo Town for Joe Talamo and Echo Town race the way. And Echo Town is drawing away in the stretch. Echo Town wins the Allen Turkin Stakes. A sire line so prolific, it repeats itself. Echo Town. 
The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Uncle Mo had a new stakes winner last week, Scooby Quando. A three-year-old trained by Ben Colebrook won the Turfway Preview Stakes on debut. He is the 87th Northern Hemisphere-born stakes winner for Uncle Mo, who stands for 150000 this year. Oh, and Uncle Mo's emergence, he's a sire of sires now. Golden Pal and Mo Donegal are new this year. Ashford's Motown has his first three-year-olds this year and already has several stakes winners. We already mentioned Uncle Mo's Arabian Knight, who is on the Kentucky Derby Trail. Bill, Scooby Quando. Yeah, what a gutsy move by trainer Ben Colebrook. The horse was in the day before in a maiden special weight race on the awesome eligible list and didn't get in. So rather than just giving up and waiting for another month for a race to come up, he wheeled the horse back as a first-time starter in the Turfway Stakes race. Uh, congratulations to Colebrook. Job well done, and we'll keep an eye on Scooby Quando down the road. But other news that came out during the week, we get the annual handle figures, the uh, uh, all the figures on the business of racing that come out from Equibase. And, and here are the numbers in the nutshell, which you need to know. Um, the handle for the year was $12.1 billion, which was a decrease of 0.87%. However, um, pretty good numbers. It was better than it was three or four years ago, and certainly much better than it was in 2020 during the pandemic. But the big news was that purses were up 10.92% in the year at $1.3 billion, a record for purses for thoroughbred racing. Uh, it goes back to 1988 when the Jockey Club first started keeping the records. And that year it was $676 million. So purses have nearly doubled in, so what's that, 12, 34 years. Uh, inflation, obviously, you have to take into account. But, but guys, to me, I'm not so sure this is such a good story. And here's why. These numbers tell you exactly what we've known for quite some time. The sport is way too dependent on subsidies from casinos. And, you know, someday you have to worry they're going to go away or they're going to go be taken away in part. Another factor is your track, Zoe, California. It's the it's out on an island now. It is the only major racetrack in the country trying to get by without casino revenue. Horse racing should be able to stand on its own two feet and not have to worry about subsidies. Unfortunately, it doesn't. That's not the situation. I applaud the industry for getting 12 billion bet. That's good, even though the numbers several years ago were 15 billion. So it has gone down since then. But I always worry about this marriage of slot machines, casinos, and horse racing. Just some day does it turn into, are they sign the divorce papers, and it, it, when and if that happens, it's going to be calamitous for horse racing. Yeah, but the related problem is the concern about what would happen to horse race tracks if there were no casino subsidies. I, you know, I, I, we had Lou Sella on, I guess it was maybe about a month ago from Oakland Park, and, and he made a pretty bold statement at the start of our conversation that he believes that ultimately no racetracks in the United States will be able to survive without some forms right. of alternative gaming. I think there, there may be some exceptions to that, uh, but... I mean, we've seen Churchill Downs Incorporated embrace it wholeheartedly as a primary corporate strategy. Uh, First Racing at Gulfstream has done it. Naira has done it at Aqueduct. You know, I mean, it's just, to me, it, it's it's an unfortunate reality. I think we all would love to see Thoroughbred Racing be able to stand on its own two, two feet. But in an era where the costs of everything have skyrocketed, in an era where the, the value of real estate has gone way up. Uh, I just fear that without the expanded gaming to help these racetracks, a lot of them would go the way of Hollywood Park, where the land that the racetrack sits on is more valuable than the profit that the racetrack could generate. Yeah, I mean, you look at Hollywood, you look at Arlington Park. Unfortunately, this is what we're living with right now in this day and age. And horse racing is expensive. And the more money to be made, that's where the people are going. And that is why you're seeing Oaklawn flourishing right now. That's why you're seeing Kentucky Downs flourishing, these huge mammoth purses that the people with the good horses are going to because that's where the money is. And there are no ifs, ands, or buts. Now, sports betting will flourish eventually in all states, and hopefully horse racing will be able to take a good chunk of that because that is the only way forward, unfortunately. There is no magic wand to be waved over the sport of horse racing. I, I firmly believe that 
this is going to have to be the way forward. And unless some multi-billionaires, a hundred of them come forward and want to subsidize horse racing. Zoe, I want to go back to another thing that I brought up because, you know, you're obviously you're very involved. You are work for First Race and you work at Santa Anita, you work for XBTV. I'm not sure people really understand the disadvantage Santa Anita and, of course, um, Del Mar and then Golden Gate Fields are at. A, you know, right now you look at the purse structure. I mean, Santa Anita is the great race place. It is historic. It is fantastic. It has a great race meet. But the purses there don't come close to equally in Oakland Park. Um, I'd have to look this up, but I bet you they don't even quite even match Turfway Park. And if that's the case, let's say for all practical purposes, they're about the same as Turfway. Santa Anita going against Turfway. And you see, you know, uh, California finish like Doug O'Neill has a string at Turfway Park. You know, kudos to, to management out there because they've kept the game going. They kept it going at a high level. But, you know, just how difficult has this slot mania made it for California racing? It's made it very difficult. And I think that's one of the reasons that Santa Anita and Del Mar have teamed up to introduce the ship and win. Because that some way in part, horses coming out of state, they get five grand to start. And then they have two or three starts to be eligible for the ship and win. They get an extra 30 to 40% on top of what they're making. So if you win a maiden special weight, you are literally on par to what horses are making at Turfway, at Kentucky Downs, at Churchill, at Oaklawn. And the thing about Kentucky is that you've got to be Kentucky bred. Can you still hear me? It's like there's a big disco going on out here. Anyway, you have to be Kentucky bred. If you're not Kentucky bred, you're running for the exact same purses that we're running for in California. So. A lot of times you have to look beyond the $100,000 purse, the $100,000 maiden. If you're not Kentucky bred, you're not running for those. But if you're running here in Southern California and you're from out of state, we're encouraging people to come in. There are huge bonuses to be made and a lot of good reasons to run here. Randy, the other stat that caught my attention, and it's a very minor drop, but the average field size, 7.3, down from 7.37. And this is the lowest in the history. It goes down every year. I mean, it, fortunately, it's not going down in huge chunks. But, you know, again, here's another here's another one of these conundrums for horse racing. If I were to tell an outsider that, hey, the horse racing purses have never been higher, they say, well, people are just dying to run horses. And no, that's not the case. The average field size has never been lower. And, you know, this is another sense, something that sets off an alarm with me. You know, we all know that the smaller the field size is, the worse it is for the game. The betters don't want this. You know, is is 7.3 in 2022 turn into 7.12 in 2023? Then do we go under seven? It looks like this is another trend where there's no reverse to it. I am not nearly smart enough to come up with the answer to this. But again, when you say the smallest field sizes in recorded history of horse racing, that's alarming. I mean, we all know that the larger the average field size, the better it is for betters, and the more horse players tend to wager in a situation like that. There's only two solutions. One would be to breed more horses, and two would be to run fewer races. Uh, obviously, the industry is not breeding more horses, as you pointed out. That trend is going down and down and down every year. I think the inescapable conclusion is that right now we're running too many races in the sport. And there needs to be a reduction in the number of racing days to kind of get that supply and demand back in whack a little bit. But good luck convincing some of these racetracks. Uh, like Gulfstream Park, for example, which runs essentially year round nowadays, uh, to dial back on some of their racing days to improve field sizes. I just don't think that's going to happen either. It's a conundrum. Well, there's one other solution that you didn't mention. Would people please start running their horses more often? I mean, if horses were making 10, 11 starts a year like they did in the good old days of 1980 or something like that, then the average field size would be up. Everybody ought to call up my man, Lynn Cash, say, Lynn, how you doing this, running these damn things every 10 days, and, and uh, take a lesson from a guy that's been very successful. <laughs> I'm afraid that's probably not going to happen either, Phil. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a trend right now that that is troubling. Uh, racing is, you know, is hanging on despite it, but I mean, maybe we'll see some good news and we'll get a little turnaround in one of those metrics, but it, right now the trends are going in the wrong direction. Certainly are. 
The PHBA Stallion Season Auction will be held January 15th through the 22nd. Go to thoroughlybred.com, an online marketplace, to register prior to that auction and view the available seasons. And some of the Kentucky-based stallions with seasons being offered, Accelerate, Dialed In, Nick's Go, Caracante, Matole, Tom's Day Ta, Vino Rosso, and more. And there are plenty of Pennsylvania sires in there as well. Remember, Pennsylvania sired, Pennsylvania breads will be eligible for that PHBA Stallion Series featuring six stakes now and $1 million in purses in 2023. We'll be right back after these messages from the PHBA. Here in Pennsylvania, we're proud of our breeding program, the best in North America, but we're also proud to be leaders in this industry. The PA Horse Breeders Association is funding cutting edge research at Penn Vet to detect gene doping in thoroughbreds. And we endorsed the SAFE Act to help protect the most vulnerable horses. Plus, we're pleased to support the aftercare programs set up by our horsemen's groups. Just a few of the reasons why you should join us in Pennsylvania, the premier place to breed and race. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry with more than 500 clients in the horse business. The Green Group has proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more at www.greenco.com. And our Guest of the Week is Tom Rooney, beginning his second year as president and CEO of the National Thoroughbred Racing Association. For 10 years, Tom served in the U.S. House of Representatives. He's also an Army veteran, a lawyer, and comes from a family with a long history in sports and horse racing, which we will get into shortly. Uh, but Tom, first of all, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, before we drill down into details, I just want to start with an overview. We've witnessed the role of the NTRA over the past quarter century sort of change, uh, maybe out of a pragmatic view about what it could actually hope to accomplish given the regulatory framework in the sport. Uh, so what do you see as the primary roles of today's NTRA? Well, I think it's actually, you know, a good thing that I, I'm kind of new to the industry as far as, as far as being part of the industry in, in, in that respect. I think it's good that I don't really have the historical knowledge of what the NTRA was, because quite frankly, I don't think that that's what the board hired me to do is to, reflect on what we used to be or what we're going to be. And, um, you know, for me, the mission of the NTRA is to be an advocate for horse racing in Washington, D.C. And as a former member of Congress and um, somebody who just opened an office in Washington, D.C. this summer, uh, reconnecting with my friends on the Hill um, and, and doing all the things that I need to do for legislators and power brokers in Washington to look at our office as the go-to when they're thinking about matters regarding horse racing. So, um, you know, I see we do a lot of things. Obviously, we do the Eclipse Awards, the National Horse Players Championship. You know, we, we, we have our, our, uh, our fingers in a lot of things, but the primary focus on why they hired me um, was to be their advocate in Washington. So we can't talk about Washington and horse racing without diving a little bit into HISA. Uh, the more pessimistic among us thought in late uh, November or mid-November when it was declared unconstitutional that it would perhaps be the death knell for HISA, but instead, pretty quickly, uh, a language revision was inserted into the omnibus spending bill and lo and behold, now there's optimism again. Uh, how involved were you in the NTRA in that? And can you give us sort of a glimpse maybe into what was going on behind the scenes in Washington dur during all that? Uh, I was pretty frantic. And um, we had, uh, you know, we started off with weekly calls that soon became daily calls after the ruling by the court. Um, trying to use the lame duck session and the urgency therein. Um, almost to our advantage because we made it uh, uh, very clear to uh, Leader McConnell's office and to uh, Senator Schumer's office that this had to be done. I cautioned the, the people that were on our calls, which were leaders in our industry, that in 10 years of being in Congress, I've never seen something get ruled unconstitutional. And then in a lame duck session, using the language that the court said was a problem, 
having that change so that we could go back to the court and be like, see, we fixed it. Um, I, I said, you have to be very, very pragmatic and understand that this is probably not going to happen. But I think that it shows in, in this day of partisanship that uh, on an issue like this, where it's important to New York, it's important to Kentucky, that those two men came together and they didn't try to use it as a, a some point of leverage to get something else. They both recognized that it was important for our industry to have uh, uniform standards and to have racetrack safety um, and, and accountability and integrity uh, for us to move forward. And so uh, we had sort of that unicorn situation where we, we had a very short window of time. We made it incumbent upon those two men, especially that uh, we needed this language fix and um, we were able to get it done despite, you know, a, a pretty good opposition uh, with regard to people that oppose TISA. Um, so we, we had to work very hard to make sure that we we pressed the issue again with those two men and the rest of the members that were going to vote that had problems with it. I was making phone calls um, days before uh, to members of the Senate that I'm friends with explaining to them a lot of people just didn't know what it meant but they thought it you know they thought it meant more you know of of a government overreach rather than something that you know help would help our industry and i think that once they understood that they kind of moved on to the next thing so whereas randy you and i might think that heist is the most important thing in the world for a lot of these people they're like what is this heist thing why why am i getting phone calls about it and so my job was to push back with with those members and with those senators to say, listen, this is what it's going to do. And this is why it's important. And this is why we need it. Um, regardless of what the other side might be telling you that the sky is falling. Um, this is really important for the advancement of our industry. So you served 10 years in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, for lack of a better phrase, you stepped away undefeated. Uh, probably frustrated, I'm guessing, at the relative disappearance of bipartisanship in Washington compared to the way maybe it used to be and perhaps the way it should be. So how optimistic were you, given all this, that you could bring the two sides together and actually get this done? I was not optimistic at all. Um, you know, I thought that there was, I, I think I told the, the, the people on the phone call that we met with on a daily basis or a weekly basis that we probably had a 5% chance of success. Wow. You know, one of the, one of the reasons why I, you know, probably hung them up, so to speak, in, in, in Congress, um, was that you, you go to Washington, you get elected and it's a big moment for you and your family. And you're like, I'm going to go to Washington and get things done and make a difference for my community and my district. And then you go up there and you're one of 435 and you're a freshman and it's just like, you know, go sit in the back and keep your mouth shut. And back then being a good soldier actually meant something positive. You could get yourself on good committees. You could put yourself in a position of leadership. And I did all those things and quite quickly after I got elected in the next couple terms, actually being a bad soldier going against your own leadership became a way to get yourself more popular and more money. So then I was sort of like in this, you know, I don't know, you know, this is like crazy opposite world. And so, um, but we did move up pretty quick and, and, you know, and I, I saw, you know, to, to really get things done, getting in a position of leadership or chairmanship or, or that kind of thing, that's where the real power is. But, I had a decision to make with regard to, you know, I, I'd always said I'd only serve 10 years. And, you know, that was predestined by me thinking that my kids would be going into high school and I didn't want to miss their games or anything. So, you know, sure enough, when 10 years came around and my kids were both playing varsity football and, you know, I just didn't want to miss any games. And, you know, we were going, the Rep I was a Republican, we're going into the minority and the minority really control nothing. Um, so, you know, that, that's why I decided not to run for an 11th term, but, and I don't regret it at all. I mean, there's very few times where I was just like, man, I was, I was up there, you know, during that circus, but, um, 
But I will say it has been nice to go back in this capacity and go into members' offices that I was friends with, including those on leadership. And they're like, hey, Rooney, like, what are you doing now? And then I tell them, and they're like, oh, that's perfect for you. And so, like, you know, that's good. And that's part of the process that when um, I do have to go ask them for something or for help or to kill something potentially, um, that those friendships have been established over. I didn't burn any bridges while I was there on either side of the aisle. So hopefully that's an advantage. You're probably especially glad you were no longer uh, in the House, given the, the the speaker of the House fracas that, that just ensued within the Republican Party. But I, yeah. I won't get you into that. I don't think we have enough time. Uh, how optimistic are you now that this language had, has been revised, that that's going to satisfy the Court of Appeals and uh, and and Heisa can also survive uh, any other challenges and actually be instituted the way many in the sport hope it will? I, I'm confident, um, and I, I think that we addressed exactly what the court's problems were. There's going to be litigation, and there's going to be, you know, pop shots taken at other parts of the bill that don't have to do with the, the ruling. Um, I don't think that those are fatal, and even if they were ruled against, I think that they could be separated without having to try again with the legislative fix, which would be even more difficult with this Congress. Um, but the, the big question, Randy, without getting too much in the weeds, is the way that the, the way that the law is constitutional is based on a model from a previous law called FINRA. And some conservatives have had problems with FINRA and the idea of the legislature delegating um, authority to the executive branch through a private entity like I Zoe, um, like, like HISA, um, that has been, that has been challenged before and FINRA has succeeded. But, uh, it's, it, if, if HISA is not successful constitutionally, that means FINRA will also not be successful. And that, and that, and that's a law that's been around for decades. Um, that would be a huge shift in, what is deemed uh, constitutional and unconstitutional in this country. So, I mean, if we get to that point, then we're really in trouble. But I just don't see that happening. All right. Zoe is back with us now. There have been rainstorms in California that obviously we all know about that obviously interfered with her uh, Internet reception. So, Zoe, we've we've pretty much gone through HISA with a fine toothed comb right now. So uh, you pick it up now. Oh, well, it, we've had rain of biblical proportions here, especially for Southern California. So I apologize. We've missed most of it. I think my first question would be, you know, do you Zoom with Lisa Lazarus over a glass of wine every night to try and sort out <laughs> this kind of thing? But I, I think you might have already flown by that because I think Lisa's been a great proponent for the game. No, I, I cannot say enough about Lisa. She's she sort of, you know, showed up on the scene about the same time I did. So we were sort of the, the two new kids on the block, so to speak. And we've talked a lot about, you know, um, this whole last year, many times, not not over a Zoom glass of wine, but, you know, maybe in person. But um, she's she is she is just such an asset to our industry, not only with her intelligence her background, but also one of the biggest things that she brings to the table, I think, which is hugely important, is her empathy for the opposition and to not just discard people. It'd be so easy for some people to be like, you know, the hell with you. This is the law. So deal with it. I think that Lisa really tries her best to understand what the opposition's um, problems are and to try to come together and do the best that she can to bring them on board. It's not always successful. In fact, most of the time it's not. But I've never seen anybody that has met with her or she's traveled to go see a group of people that oppose. She walks into the lion's den more than anybody I know and knowing she's going to. And where where um, she walks out of that room and the opposition is asked how to go. Nobody says we can't stand her. Everybody says the opposite. So I think that I think that that is a huge asset to to us and to HISA's success that um, 
she's not willing to take a us versus them attitude. And, and, uh, we, you know, we really, that, that takes a lot of patience and a lot of skill to be able to do that. So, um, I'm, I'm very much glad she's, uh, she's here. Tom, you've got plenty of skin in the game. I, I believe you're probably pretty fluent with the pitchfork in your hand. Your family's got farm. Uh, you've been around horses your whole life. You've been in Congress. Your family actually owns the Palm Beach Kennel Club, which we saw recently the Greyhound racing deceasing yeah. basically in Florida. Has this really given you a little bit more of a push to get into horse racing and try and push it moving forward so that does not happen in any shape or form? Absolutely. I mean, there, there's no doubt that, um, you know, I have felt this at the most personal level. You know, I, I told the story out in Arizona when I first got this job that our family has run uh, Yonkers Racetrack, um, Green Mountain Racetrack in Vermont, no longer there, which was which was thoroughbreds, harness, and dogs um, at one point. And then Liberty Bell Racetrack, which is now a strip mall, um, at Palm Beach Kennel Club, which now does not have Greyhounds. So it, do, it is not lost on me in the least how important it is to make sure that we are doing and saying the right things to make sure that thoroughbred racing does not go the way of uh, of other things and as part of things like sports betting and as part of things like HISA to where we are considered a, a national sport along the lines of the NFL and Major League Baseball and in that that kind of, uh, you know, vision. So um, I know how fragile, to answer your question, it can be and how quickly it can go. Um, you know, once, especially in the age of social media and likes and that kind of thing, you know, it, it's, it's a lot easier for somebody to pile on our industry with a, with a video or, or something and, and garner, you know, some kind of support that you can't respond to. Our job is to respond and to do so in a way that shows that we're doing everything that we can to be fair in the love of our sport. But, you know, also to answer your question, I just, you know, I grew up, my grandfather got involved in in horse racing very early on. Uh, you know, there would be no Pittsburgh Steelers if there was no horse racing in our family. That's that that goes hand in hand. So, um, you know, when I was younger and I would go back to the backstretch with with my grandfather and I saw him talking to the jockeys and the trainers and see a horse with the veins and, you know, steam coming up and I just thought it was magic. I mean, I, I, I bought in hook, line and sand. I know not everybody does like the, you know, my wife was like, what are we doing in the backstretch? Let's, you know, get out of the way. But, um, so I, I've always been that way. And then when I got elected to Congress, I, I went up to, we have a, my grandfather's farm up in Maryland. Um, I took my kids when they were little up to see the, the foals and, uh, there was a horse, a, a filly there that had been abandoned. Um, I guess somebody wasn't paying their bills and the farm manager was like, two year old, great looking filly, great confirmation. Do you want her? I'm like, I don't know what to do with her. I'm driving an SUV. Like he's like, no, we'll send her to, you know, get broken. And so I was learning all this stuff. And of course she ends up winning her first race. She wins her third race. So I'm like, this is great. Like, let's go to the winter circle again. <laughs> um, but and then she came in second in the Maryland Million Ladies. And so, um, you know, that was that was the beginning. And so now here, 12 years later, I don't I, I can't even tell you, you know, my my wife uh, keeps track of this. Um, but it's I probably got four brood mares and I try to send some to the sales, keep a filly here and there to race myself. And just got, you know, my first horse that I bred that won a stakes race happened last week. So it was awesome. It's great. That's yeah. a great story. Your, your grandfather's a great story. I mean, when people hear about Art Rooney, when the name Art Rooney, it's always in conjunction with the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Pittsburgh Pirates, as they were known way back when he first founded right. the franchise. Right. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that your grandfather was one of, if not the best known professional horse players of the 1930s. You referenced that he used his money as a professional gambler 
to buy the Pittsburgh Steelers franchise to begin with, with partners. Uh, but some of his exploits in gambling, especially at Saratoga, are just legendary. Did you hear any yeah. of those family stories? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, it's 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 sort of passed down at Thanksgiving dinner to your children to make sure you understand <laughs> why we live in this house. But, uh, you know, it, he 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 went on, a, well, I guess what they call now a little bit of a heater up in New York at, and not only Saratoga, but I guess what was then Empire, which became Yonkers. I guess they had thoroughbreds or and um he won so that's back with bookmakers, and I guess he won so much money by a certain race on the card that they had to cancel the rest of the races because they didn't have any more money. And so he got a police escort to the New York Pennsylvania border and told my grandmother that they'd never have to worry about money again. And about that time, my uncle was a part of, or my great uncle was part of a semi pro football. It wasn't legal to have sports on Sundays back then in Pennsylvania. So he took over that um, club team. And then in 1933, they allowed um, professional sports on Sundays. And his betting buddies up at Saratoga were George Hallis, Tim Mara of the, of the uh, Giants, um, you know, a, a guy named Burt Bell from the, sorry, the Eagles and somebody else from uh, Washington or, or thereabouts named uh, Marshall that started uh, a team in, in um, Boston. But there's a great book about this called The League, by the way, which is those five guys in Saratoga as young men. I think it'd be a great movie talking about we should start a pro football league. And um, so, yeah, that's how it all started. But Randy, to be honest with you, I mean, the Steelers were horrible for 40 years. And to make payroll, my grandfather got into the racing business with these racetracks, but also as a handicapper, he used to make payroll by winning at the track or by, you know, these other racetracks that he, he had acquired um, was the way that he funded that football team. And until... Uh, ironically enough, recently, the celebration of the Immaculate Reception's 50-year anniversary, that, that really changed our franchise around um, with, with that one play. So we've been very lucky. <laughs> what you referenced is this book, That's written it. by John Eisenberg, who happens to be a friend of mine. Uh, oh, and John cool. tells the story of 1937 Saratoga meeting of your grandfather leaving the meet with a profit of around $400,000, which in yeah. today's money would be, what, three to four million? It's just yeah. unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, so that, that's a great book. That's a great book. So, How's your gambling prowess, Tom? Are you, are you uh, not good. <laughs> I, I, I've not gotten that. In fact, I, I got a lot of crap from my high school buddies that were all celebrating my win in the Hef Stakes last week as the breeder. Um, like, well, how much did you bet? I'm like, I bet $20 on them to show. And they're like, what? I'm just like, I, you know, I don't like, I don't like betting on my own horses. I don't know why I'll do $20 usually to win just as like sort of a karma thing. But, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm good with the purse money and, and, and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, I remember when I was younger and we were at the dog track and my grandfather was sitting there with me and I, went up to bet. He's like, what are you doing? And I said, I, I'm betting. He's like, don't ever bet. You don't know what you're doing. And I'm just like, well, you bet all the time. And he's just like, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm like, okay. So, you know, do, do, do as I say, not as I do. But um, well, this is the perfect segue to the National Horse Players Championship, right? In, yeah. uh, in, in Las Vegas. Tell us a little bit about the, about that on the horizon here for the this, NCR. This event, I honestly, you know, I, I had no idea what to expect when I first saw it last year. And so when you walk into that room in Las Vegas, it really feels like a World Series of poker type situation. Plus, we have we had all these uh, football games because last year it was early. It was in January. Now, we moved it to March to sort of like capture the March Madness stuff. But so you've got all these sporting events on huge screen TVs and they've got all these tables in this in this ballroom. Um, uh, but, you know, the thing that I, I expressed to them was sort of partly that story at the dinner later that, you know, my affinity towards horse players is equal to my affinity towards horses. So. 
Um, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for people like them and people um, listening to people and, and, and the ideas and the complaints that they have about how it's more, what would be more advantageous for them as, as a better. Um, so I listened to that with a very keen ear. And so, but the, 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 the event itself was awesome. Um, the room was great. You know what I also noticed was the fellowship at those tables. I don't know if you've all ever been there, but these, these people have been playing together or, you know, at least near each other or whatever, uh, for years and years and years. So, I mean, there, there's definitely this sort of like microcosm of a community with these high end horse players that, I think when they get to go out to Vegas every year to reconnect, it's uh, it's a big family. And so um, I, I loved it. I can't wait to go back. It, it is such a great event. And I think that it can be, you know, I'd like to make it, you know, invite people from abroad or make it a little bit more international or something like that. Have like an international table. Um, and, and there's other things that we can do. Maybe like the final table is more visible on TV um, kind of like the last table in the World Series of Poker. Um, so those are things that we'll figure out as as we go on. But, you know, the guy that won it last year, who will be at the Eclipse Awards this year, um, you know, he was, he, he was, you know, a middle-class guy from upstate New York. And when he got the check, he's like, this, this is going to change my family's life. And I mean, it's sort of like what I said before, you know, and, and, and hopefully that it does. But, um, Anyway, it's a great event. That being said, what does the 2023 gambling landscape look like? Because we saw Penny, Penny Breakage Pass in Kentucky, which is absolutely fantastic. What can horse players look forward to in 2023? Well, I think that, you know, the, the, um, the sport is definitely on a good trend. Uh, the, the metrics and the numbers that we've seen uh, – uh, over the last year, overall, when, when you're talking about purses and you're talking about, um, you know, handle and, and, and the like, the, the trends, I think, are all very good. There, there was a couple things that were, there were down that, you know, you can explain. But when you go to these sales and you see at the sales level um, with regard to handle, with regard to purses, um, when you got a horse like flight line, it definitely helps. When you got an 80 to one shot win in the Derby, that does not hurt. Um, so I think that, I think that, you know, it, it's going to be based on what kind of product we put out there. And, and, and if, if this year, this past year, I'm sorry, is precedent, we should be in good shape. I mean, obviously we all hold our breath on, on our big races to, to hope for clean trips and, um, and, and a good day for everybody, but um, I, I feel good. But the one thing that I'm focused on, which will get to, I think, the next generation, uh, is to do what I can at the federal level, which we've worked with credit card companies and the like to try to get what's called a single wallet on the sports betting apps. Um, one of my biggest focuses for the sake of the gambler is to try to figure out a way to integrate horse racing, which as you all know, was the only legal sport in, in our country for the longest time. And now we're competing in certain states with all sports. And so um, FanDuel is one of my board members and, and we were able to work with them to get um, uh, horse racing on a FanDuel uh, shared application so you don't have to go off one app to get on another one. If you're betting on football or hockey to go on and bet on horse racing, that's a big step. The biggest step, though, for me, from the gambler's point of view, I think is going to be, you know, I have college age sons and they talk about, oh, I did a $20 parlay where I put in, you know, the, the Steelers and the Sixers and Villanova basketball and Every time you add one, your $20 moves up and up and up. And, you know, I remember my son asking me like, you know, yo, dad, who's going to win the, the Kentucky Derby? And then he's like, well, I can't find it on my app. That's a problem. He has to be able to find it on his app. I have to be able to tell him that this is the horse that I was going to win 
add that to your parlay and what's that boost it to? Um, the problem is, is that we, we operate in the paramutual system. I'm not saying paramutual system is a problem. I'm saying that that's why they can't tell you when you put your $20 down what the end result is going to be because it fluctuates. So states like New Jersey, as you probably know, have, well, I was at the Haskell this year and they had a fixed odds option. Um, you know, I know that it, that's available in Ireland and England and probably elsewhere. So, um, whether or not that can be integrated to, in, into our sport, uh, nationally, uh, remains to be seen. New Jersey has tried it, but I've also, you know, when I first took this job and I was reading articles about fixed odds versus paramutual odds. Um, you know, I thought, well, it's, it's, we, we got to get a fixed odds, it, 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 at least for the grade ones. There's got to be a fixed odds option. But then, you know, the more people I talk to, very smart, very intelligent people in our industry have said, we're close to being able to figure out a way to do it with paramutual too. So, um, w- that's where we are right now, but that is going to be a game changer. I think when people like my son and his friends at his college are able to, you know, loop in the Breeders' Cup Classic or the Derby or the Preakness and what they're doing, that's that's the future of sports betting. And I don't buy this, by the way. I've heard the arguments. Well, well that's going to take away uh, – that's going to move people from horse racing to they're going to get – if, if you, you know, they're going to move to footballers. I'm like, if you know how to bet on the horses and – you know, I seriously doubt they're like, oh, my God, I can bet on football. Like, I'm just going to move to football. I think that people that bet on horses bet on horses. And um, I don't think that we're going to lose those people that are going to go. Now I'm just going to go bet on football. I think it's going to gain people that bet on football that now know that they can bet on horses. Uh, I think that. But I could be wrong. But um, we we cannot be left out of legalized sports gambling. Um moving forward in the future. And, and so, I, you know, one of the biggest things that I'm going to work on is that. Well, those are fantastic objectives, Tom. The sport is lucky to have someone like you in the position that you're at. Horse players are fortunate to have you where you're at. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. The Green Group Guest of the Week was brought to you by The Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. And as this week's Guest of the Week, Tom Rooney of the NTRA will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Again, learn more at www.greenco.com. Now, we'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year-round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all-time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Brents. Breed them. Raise them race them. We all win. You don't have to know anything about horse racing to know that Kentucky is the horse capital of North America and some would say the horse capital of the world where the the stats from 2022 are in. And if you need more justification of that, 78% of all the grade one races in the U.S. were won by Kentucky bred. 69% of all the Graded races, not just grade one, grade two or three as well, won by Kentucky Breds. And nine of the top 10 earners in 2022 were Kentucky Breds, including, of course, Breeders' Cup Classic winner, Flightline. Well, not only NFL fans, but all of America was captivated by the story of the Buffalo Bills safety, DeMar Hamlin. And the story began on a very 
awful, ominous note as it looked like he literally was going to lose his life after a tackle in a Monday night football game. But it turned out to be a good news story in the long run as he has been dismissed from a, a hospital in Cincinnati, now back home in Buffalo doing great, uh, Is looks like he is going to have a full recovery. And But it leads you to horse racing. And as dangerous as the NFL can be, it's not nearly as dangerous as horse racing, which I think is the most dangerous uh, sport. But horse racing had its own Damar Hamlin story. And T.D. Thornton, our colleague in the Thoroughbred Daily News, had a really good story in his week in review. A jockey by the name of Jory Scriver was injured last week in a spill at Sunland Park. And the early reports were that she was paralyzed. Um, and, you know, it is just an awful story for any young jockey to, for this, to be going through this. T.D. got her on the phone, uh, didn't even expect to get her. He thought he was going to get through, get to a uh, her boyfriend. She picks up the phone, and she now has feeling in her legs. We don't know yet how far this recovery is going to go, if she's going to be fully recovered at the end of the day. But certainly, like with Hamblin, good news, heading in the right direction, and there's reason to believe that she's going to be okay. So yeah, I'm sure this story hit home with you because not only is it a fellow female rider, but, you know, you live this, the dangers of horse racing, the constant fear of this. What were your thoughts when you read this story? Well, male, female, it doesn't really matter. Right. I'm just delighted that she does have some kind of feeling in her lower extremities as of this recording, as of T.D. Thornton's article. She did crack a few vertebrae and break a few ribs. And she's in good spirits, which is good. And you can go to the TDN website and look up her GoFundMe page. I think I've shared it on my Twitter account as well. And, you know, put some money in there if you want, because, you know, people look at the jocks like Johnny V, like Frankie Dettori, Joel Rosario. Basically, the top 5% of jockeys in the country make a very good living and live very good jobs, very, very nicely indeed. But the rest of them are living day to day, like basically 80% of the whole worldwide jockey currently is struggling. And this injury, this type of injury is going to set her back an awful long way. And what people think about jockeys, they think of Kentucky Derby. They don't think about the day to day running Turf Paradise, Zia Park, Charlestown. These are the guys that are really working and really living it. This is a sport where an ambulance follows us. An ambulance doesn't follow the NFL players. It's there. But an ambulance doesn't follow them going 30 miles an hour and a vet truck follow them at 30 miles an hour. This is a sport where you can't have any kind of fear. If you go in the gate and you're wondering what's going to happen, then you've got no business being in the starting gate in the first place. So kudos out to these jockeys. It is a choice at the end of the day. And it's a choice that they all make gladly because the bulk of them love what they're doing and they love the horses and they love the industry. But at the same time, it's a very dangerous sport and it's not all that you see on the TV. It's the day-to-day -day nitty gritty, the bottle bottom end claimers, the blue collar workers that really make this sport go round. And we as an industry should stand up and support the people that really do make this sport go round. Yeah, it, the DeMar Hamlin injury took place on January the 2nd. It was a, a Monday night football game on ESPN, one of the most uh, anticipated games of the season between the Bills and the Bengals. And so there were millions of people watching and just created this massive uplifting swell of publicity that continues to this day as we all watch his recovery. The very day before, January 1st, um, was when Jory's injury happened at Sunland Park in anonymity, a small race at Sunland Park. I'm sure there were a lot of people within the thoroughbred industry that weren't even aware of the spill and of her injuries until T.D. Thornton wrote about it. Everyone read it in the TDN. Such a difference in publicity between the two, even though her injuries you know, are going to require a much more extensive rehab. So uh, fingers crossed. I know we're all uh, you know, we're all uh, hoping and praying that uh, that she turns the corner and recovers. And it's just, uh, as you pointed out, Zoe, just another example of the dangers that uh, that these jockeys face every day at every track. And while we're at it, um, and we don't need to debate this, but I just want to bring this up. There's another very good story by TD uh, as he did the coverage of, of veterinarian Louis Grasso. And you, you got to look this up. Grasso is on, uh, I think, January 24th is the date will be uh, sent off to jail for his role in the Navarro service. He was a vet supplying all these people with drugs, whatnot. 
So we already know the guy's a crook. But what we didn't know is he's the dumbest man alive. And that is what he <laughs> has to be to have done what he did. So on his way, he's sitting at home waiting for us to go to jail. What does he do? He goes to a casino, um, Pocono Downs, a harness track, and decides to rig an electronic dice game. And, and uh, with along with the dealer where they the, the dice, um, you could see the outcome of the roll of dice um, and then make your bets. So it's like betting on a horse race after the race is over. He managed to win about $24,000. He actually thought he wasn't going to get caught. The casino wasn't going to figure this out. So congratulations, Louis Grasso. You were the dumbest man alive. All right. So on that note, um, we uh, end about to end this week's segment of the Thoroughbred Daily News podcast. But before we do that, we got a lot more to come. What's going on with XBTV, Zoe? As we all know, the TDN Writers Room is brought to you in part by XBTV. XBTV.com's workout of the week is nuclear. He worked out in 48 and 3 on Saturday. He is a $1.55 million purchase for West Point Thoroughbreds and Tala Racing at Keeneland. Seen working here on the 5th. We'll be right back after these messages from XBTV. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TDN Rice's Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can literally vault you right into the winner's circle for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. Meanwhile, West Point had a winner on Sunday with Bourbon Ready, who broke his maiden for Todd Pletcher at Goldstream Park. And earlier last week, their Philly Lightress won on debut at Tampa for Christophe Clement. And this week's Remy cartoon is in. It's really cute with the, with the January sale at Keeneland's going on right now. And he kind of piggybacks off of that. He has two people looking at a horse and one person is sort of kicking the back hooves. Another horse uh, person is looking down the horse's throat, kicking the back hooves, kicking the tires, looking under the hood. Because apparently there's a lot of these people own a car dealership somewhere. So that's how they uh, go and uh, look at horses at the sales. Well, once again, another segment of the Thoroughbred Daily News Writers Room podcast is in the books. I want to thank our entire team. We want to thank Tom Rooney, our Green Group Guest of the Week, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, uh, Katie Petruniak, and our whole team of Zoe uh, Cadman, Randy Moss, myself, as long as our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Alita LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. We'll be back at the same time next week. Thanks for joining us. See you then.